Good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to talk about my study. Um, I've been privileged to work on this uh, for the last 22 years, and I'm very happy to share some of the findings with you. Um, I would like to begin with acknowledging the Larrakia people on whose land we stand today, and to pay my respect to the elders past, present, and emerging. All right. I do have a little structure for my talk, but basically I'm going to try and paint a picture of the study and how we began and where we've got to where we are today. So right in the beginning, it began with our study founder, uh, Professor Susan Sayers. She came here first in 1974, which local people will remember as the year of the Cyclone Tracy, which decimated the city. And Sue at that loved to tell us that she was the only pediatrician when the cyclone actually hit the hospital on uh, Christmas Eve. She was also one of the first people who took up the speciality and one of the first graduates of neonatology, which in those days was known as neonatal pediatricians. Um, she, in her lifetime, was a passionate advocate for child health, and she used to love doing things on her holidays, like cycling, and she'd come back and tell us all these stories about the wine and the cheese when they did cycling in France, and forget to mention that they actually cycled over 60 kilometers every day. The other thing Sue was quite famous for uh, were her chickens, and I remember I'd gone away on a long holiday, and when I came back, she was trying to catch me up on all that had happened with the study and all that had happened in her private life. And one of the things that did happen was that her first grandchild was born, but that was number three on the list uh, after the chickens who'd won a first prize at the Royal Darwin Show and the fact that she'd got a new dog. When Sue first came to the territory in 74, she came as a trainee registrar, and we'd had a first pediatrician in Darwin at all, uh, Professor Alan Walker, and he came here in 67. He was a very inspiring person, but he was also very humble. And you can see on the graph, I've put his name there, showing the declining infant mortality, which was very high in those days. And he always said that he came at the right time and it was declining anyway, and he just happened to turn up so he could take some credit for it or get other people to give him credit for it. But you can see that although it's declined, it's still quite high. And the two arrows point to the time when Sue first got here and then when she came back after being trained in 84. The thing besides the high mortality on the ward that she noticed, was that there were a lot of small babies and a lot of small Aboriginal babies. And these two babies that you see here, they're not actually a full grown and a term baby. They're both full term babies. It's just that the one on the left of your screen is smaller. And we know that because if you look at them, their ears are well formed, they've got creases, and you can see, even though this is what we call our polite photograph, where the kids' genitalia are sort of hidden, uh, that the scrotum is actually pigmented in both these babies. So the baby on the left, although it is very much smaller than the baby on the right, is actually of the same gestational age. It's not a preterm baby. And this got Sue thinking about what happens to these very small babies? And she wanted to know how they did, what were the reasons that we were seeing so many small babies in the Aboriginal mothers, and what happened to them? Did they have more infections? Did they have more hospitalizations? How did they grow? Did they even survive? So she developed the same to look at it. And we are now acknowledged as the largest and longest running cohort of indigenous people in Australasia. But the humble beginnings were really humble. Sue had no research experience, but around the same time, the Menzies School of Health Research was being founded. We didn't have the lovely flash buildings, which you'll see if you go to visit the 
Flinders campus in RDH because they're right next door. At that time, they were based in what used to be the old nursing hostel. And John Matthews, who said, was very encouraging. He, she, he said, I'll be your supervisor. I'll help you get going, and you can have space. And the space she got was the old linen cupboard in the uh, nursing hall. But she persevered. She got herself a research assistant. And Alita Dawes, most some of you will recognize in the room, was a very enterprising young lady. So she found a table, two chairs, and a phone for the little linen cupboard. Then they acquired a filing cabinet to put their files in. And the phone was rather interesting because they didn't actually have a port to plug it in. So they plugged it in into the adjoining room and Alita found a long cord and ran it out into the corridor, up over the door, down the wall, taped it all up, and they were functional. Um, interestingly, Alita got so uh, inspired by being on the health study that she went on to do medicine and that's her graduating from her general practitioner um, degree in 2013. That wasn't the only thing that was very humble. Uh, there was no computer, no internet, there were no formal ethics, just what the institute decided on its own. And this is the first data collection sheet, which we still have on our files. So Sue hand wrote it, cyclo styled it, and all those little notations we are supposed to work out that the square was good and the circle was not so good. And that's what we transcribed into data and we work off that. About the time all this was happening, the other thing that happened in the background was a seminal paper by David Barker was published in 1989 in The Lancet. And most people will have heard of the Barker's hypothesis now, but it was, despite the fact that the idea had been around for a while, quite a new thing in those days. So Sue decided that we weren't going to stop at 10 years, we actually need to look at it longer. And that's what the study evolved into right from the beginning. So we do have a life course approach, and I very fancily title myself Director of Life Course Studies at Menzies because that's what we basically do. So where are we based? In terms of the health context, and anybody who looks at Aboriginal health, hears all these stories of doom and gloom, but we still have high rates of low birth weight, and although these are decreasing slowly, they're still twice the national average. We have very high rates of infant undernutrition still in this day's and age. We have high rates of chronic disease, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease. And kidney disease in some of our Aboriginal communities has the highest rates in the world. These diseases occur at a younger age and they, they basically contribute largely to the high premature deaths that we see in our Aboriginal people. So looking at it another way, we have lots of adverse events in early life, and we also have a lot of adverse events in later life. And so it is really tempting to think that the early life events do in some way affect the later life events. And this is basically what the theory of Barker was trying to evolve. Now there are three main ways in which you can get early life factors affecting later life factors. We all know about lifestyle and we know that the habits that we form early in life tend to stay with us, such as eating habits, how active we are, whether we take up smoking or not. And these lifestyle factors have effects into our childhood as well as into successive generations. And there's a growing body of evidence looking at low birth weight repeating generation after generation. And more and more we're seeing the effects of stress and intergenerational stress has become something that we talk about more recently. Other things that can affect this are pathology that begins in childhood and has long-term consequences. And for us, things like post-trip uh, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, and rheumatic fever are still rife in our Aboriginal population, although we almost don't see it at all in the rest of the country. And the one that we are focused on as part of the study is the programming effects. 
And that is basically suggesting that any adverse event or period leads to permanent changes in structure and function, and the effects of this are present throughout life. This could be a single hit, like Parker described, or it's now involved into what is known as the life cost theory, where basically your low birth weight or the initial adverse event sets the risk, and then multiple hits or following adverse events basically tells you whether the risk will manifest as disease or not. The last one's been popularized more recently uh, when Hillary Clinton uh, was in office. She was one of the big patrons of the thousand, first thousand days study. And we've got a program now in Australia looking at thousand days in the Aboriginal population. And basically they just add up pregnancy and the first two years of life. But really we should begin preconceptionally to look at health. It's important to remember that these things can occur together and one doesn't exclude the other happening. Just going back to Barker's uh, hypothesis for a moment, um, he was the f not the first person to sow this association, but he was the person who put it back on the stage and got us thinking about it. Interestingly, he got a lot of flack initially when he put it out, um, and there were a lot of detractors um, he wrote later on in his life a lot of pieces about how he got into this. And one piece talked about how he was able uh, to get his hands on the data that allowed him to make the association with that first paper. And this happened because of Ethel Burnside, who used to be the district health nurse of that area, who com com kept very meticulous records of all births and how the babies were growing after that. Um, you can see that's a page out of one of their registers where it was all kept. Um, and he almost didn't get his hands on this data because in addition to these great notes, they also wrote lots of descriptions about what the mothers were like, which included things like saying good mother, adequate, and feckless, which was their term for moms who weren't doing so well. And initially when he applied for this data, they told him that the mothers were still alive and it was too sensitive and he couldn't get hold of it. And then they discovered that his younger sister was actually born in the district during the relevant time. And they thought that he might actually be somebody who will deal with this in a sensitive manner. He goes on to write that basically his mum was the sort of person who was more likely to shut the door in the district nurse's face than invite them in for tea. But in any case, he got hold of the data and the rest is history now. To put it very simply, he basically told us that low birth weight increased your risk of ischemic heart disease. The initial issues with all this were that there were retrospective studies, there were a lot of missing numbers, there were convenient but inadequate surrogates, including birth weight itself, and we'll come to that in a minute. Basically, we were seeing associations and it's not causation, and the confoundings were very important, and they were confoundings due to repeated measures over time, but also due to socioeconomic factors, which seems to be the basic important determinant of a lot of things. The important thing to remember though, it's very biologically plausible. And so it did actually gain traction. And as time went on, we got supportive evidence from animal models which confirmed the association and they helped define mechanisms. And the most important of these is epigenetics, which helps us define how things happen from generation to generation. Along this time, there were a lot of longitudinal studies which helped establish the temporal uh, relationship across uh, life. And of these, probably the most well-known is the Dutch Hunger Winter, Hunger Winter Study, which had describes a very specific period of time during the Second World War when there was very limited food available during the siege and they knew exactly how many calories everybody got. They knew at what stage of pregnancy or afterwards this small period of uh, decreased calories existed. And they're still reporting on effects 50, 60 years later about what happened. And they can define it by gestation or just afterwards. 
There are other longer studies, some of which you will know, and we are a very small study in this landscape. And as time went on, especially for coronary heart disease, hypertension, stroke and diabetes, but a host of other things, these links have been shown in different populations across the world and across time. As time went on, this got expanded, and basically not only the intrauterine environment, but the adverse post-uterine environment came into play. And then this developed a life of its own, and now it's called the life course of disease. And what that implies is what I was talking about earlier with the multi-hit nature of disease. So your second adverse events, especially infections, and obesity is the main driver, both by itself as a risk factor for lifestyle chronic diseases, but also as an amplifier of other effects. And basically, all it suggests is that the programming is a mismatch between adaptive measures and your current environment. Just mention epigenetics before we go on. Epigenetics basically means above genes, and this is not due to changes in the genetic code, but it is a mechanism by which non-genetic changes can be passed from generation to generation. This is a very fledgling discipline, and it's only been going since 2001. And that's a picture of us attending the first uh, conference, which was the Fetal Origins of Health and Disease. And the little circled people are Sue right at the back, David Barker in the middle, and me in the front. And this conference was very much uh, divided into papers that supported the hypothesis and papers that refuted the hypothesis. And it was you could almost split it down the line. It has now grown. Uh, this year we are having the 11th conference. It's a biennial conference. Um, and we're having a satellite in Darwin, uh, which we are hosting just prior to it. It is a very multidiscipline um, conference. We've got everybody from perinatologists, uh, obstetricians, pediatricians, cardiovascular people, diabetes, you name it, a discipline in chronic disease, they're there. And more recently, there are people trying to talk about changing lifestyle and behavioral change. And interestingly, the person who's leading the behavioral change is David Barker's daughter, Mary Barker. Okay. So coming to our study, where are we based? You guys have come from all over the world, so we're there on the top end uh, with our cyclones, our jellyfish, and the crocs. Okay. So, a bit more specifics. Um, the Aboriginal birth cohort study was recruited between 1987 and 1990. Um, you can see Alita and Sue there, which was basically the whole of the research team at that point in time. And they recruited people at this hospital, uh, which is uh, the Royal Darwin Hospital. And it had the only inclusion criteria was that the baby had to be born to a mother who was recorded as Aboriginal in the delivery suite register. At that point in time, because of the policies of birthing, over 90% of Aboriginal babies were born at the Royal Darwin Hospital. And this just shows you the range of where they came from to get born. It does cross the borders. We do have a few participants who live in WA, but they were born at top. We did talk a bit earlier about gestational age. Um, it's really important to know an accurate gestational age, and we also used to early dating scans and people actually knowing that we forget that at that point in time, it wasn't true for anybody, not just the Aboriginal people, but only about 6.5% of the mothers who spoke to knew their LMP, and only 8% had had an early dating ultrasound. So one of the things so did for all the babies she recruited was a postnatal gestational aging scoring. And the Dubowitz method is a well-recognized method to do that. And some of the things I was showing you on the picture are part of the physical um, assessments of these. 
And it's really important uh, to know this accurately because otherwise we use the low birth weight division, which is any baby under 2.5 kilograms. And all prem babies, if they're 35 or less, basically an average weight baby of 35 uh, weeks gestation will automatically classify as low birth weight if you use that. But not all babies who are prem are actually small for their gestational age. Some of them are well grown and some of them are not well grown. So it's important to know the difference. Things have changed. One of the things that this highlighted was the fact that women in the remote areas were not getting uh, early dating ultrasounds. So the Department of Health changed its policy. And when I last looked in 2012, the figures show that at least 70% of women were getting an ultrasound before 20 weeks of gestation, which still isn't early, but it's much better than it was previously. Okay. So who made it into the study? That was 54% of all eligible babies at that time. That's only just about half of the eligible babies, but they are a representative sample because they were well matched uh, in their sex distribution, in their mean birth weights, and their birth weight frequency. Um, this graph looks like I made it up, but really their birth weight frequencies, whether they were in the study or not in the study, are very, very similar. The reason people didn't make it into the study was either because the mothers weren't available to be asked for permission for their babies to be part of the study, or Sue was actually away during that time. So what did she find? The mean birth weight on its own was not very low. It was 3,020 grams. There were about 18% of babies who were low birth weight. There were 9% who were prem, and using the definition of small for gestational age, there were actually 28% who were small for gestational age, which is about a quarter of the cohort, which is very high. If you just look at the NT average, even though 3,000 is a good birth weight, it was 300 grams less than the average for the rest of the NT. And if you look at low birth weight, it was about one-third of what the Aboriginal kids in the cohort had. Um, I don't have figures for SGA because they weren't reported gestational ages for the rest of the cohort at that point. For the factors that explained the high rates of small for gestational age or fetal growth restriction, there were three main factors. One was a maternal age less than 20, 20 years, a maternal BMI, which was less than 18.5, or maternal smoking. At what, that point in time, about 56% of the mothers smoked, and most of them, almost all of them, continued to smoke when they were pregnant. It was many years later, 11 years after the recruitment, in fact. And this is the time I came to Darwin. Sue had tried very hard to follow these kids up early on. She'd spent a lot of time trying to work out how to do the follow-up. Because even though they were all born at Royal Darwin Hospital, they went back home, and so they were spread out all across the top end. The NT population is relatively small. Darwin has 130,000 people. I put two small Victorian country towns, supposedly, and they're much the same. If we compare Townsville and Cairns, they are bigger than Darwin. And putting the three names I got from last night, they're all bigger than Darwin by quite a bit. But more than that, the population density is very low. So we only have about 0.2 people per square kilometer as soon as you get out of Darwin. So the logistics weren't easy. The people you saw in the last picture were the people who made up uh, the team. We spent a lot of time trying to work out how we were going to follow up these children, what we were going to try and collect, where we were going to see them. 
And the way is important because you could see how spread out they were. And over the previous years, Sue had spent a lot of time trying to get them into Darwin to see them as part of the follow-up for the low birth weight ones especially. And she didn't get very far. She had two attempts, which we sort of call 1B and 2B or 2A or 2 pre a uh, where at the most she saw about 150 of these children. So we made the decision that we would actually go out and see them at their place of residence. And this was a big undertaking because two-thirds of them actually lived in remote areas in sparsely populated uh, things. One of the things that we were told to do, and we do to this day, was to try and work out who had died before we got there so that we weren't trying to find people in distressing families who had actually passed away. And this is very important for Aboriginal people when they don't actually talk about people who have passed away. We did have all sorts of issues. Uh, identifying participants was one of them. We had a lot of name changes by 11 years. Um, by four years, 30% had changed their names, and that's basically because we record them under mum's names, and often by then they're registered to either go to school or preschool, and they change to the name that they're going to use. Uh, a few of them had more than um, three name changes during this time. A lot of them moved around uh, within their own areas, but still away from where we had got them as birth. But the NT does have a unique number which is given to everybody at birth uh, called the hospital record number, which did help us make sure that we were seeing the right people. And we did use other identifiers such as uh, the mum's name and figure out it was the same people. This worked well for us in the remote communities where people know each other. It was a bit harder in the urban areas where people tend not to know their neighbors quite so much. We did go out to a lot of beautiful places, and if anybody's worked in remote areas at all, you know that space has always had a premium. So at that stage, although we were based at the schools a lot, we did actually use any place that we got. Uh, we've got Dorothy, who was our nutritionist measuring a child, and the portable stadium meter is there because it was the only place that had a flat surface as well as a straight uh, column on which to put it on. Unfortunately, most clinics and school rooms tend to have curved walls with the linoleum going up to, for ease of cleaning. Not great when you want to accurately measure height. Um, that's me in the corner, younger and more nimble than I could actually get down on my haunches. Uh, and that's a bench outside a school, and I had to use that to do the ultrasounds because that was the only place where there was a plug that I could plug into. Okay. We do have a lot of challenges just because of the place. There's challenges with access. Uh, that is a Menzies car, but it wasn't me who bogged the vehicle down. Um, at that point in time, communication was an issue, um, and the um, solar pod Telstra phone booth there was the only way to get in touch with this remote community. And we did ring it regularly for a week, and then some kind person picked it up and put us in touch with the head honcho of the place, and said, he said, you can come, and off we went. Um, we do have to stop because of cultural issues. We have issues with language, examination space, I've already said. And this one uh, was one of Sue's favorite slides. That arrow points to a little blue dot uh, next to a beautiful billabong in East Arnhem Land. And that was where one of our participants had gone camping at the two visits that we went. So we actually flew over this three times, but we never did see this person. And we sort of put him in the traced but not seen category because we knew he was there, we just didn't get to see him. The other thing we did at this point was actually we wanted to get quite a lot of biomedical data. There were a lot of cohorts around, including in Australia. Um, the most well-known one is the Women's Health Study braced out of Brisbane, which follows up three generations of women. But most of these studies were very questionnaire-based, uh, including all Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, follow-ups. And so people used to ring people or get them to fill in questionnaires. 
we wanted to actually weigh, measure, take bloods, do lung functions, do ultrasounds, and we weren't quite sure how we would go at this point in time. So we actually went out and we did all these things. They're all pictures from um, things. Interestingly, we had less trouble getting blood, even from the kids, than we had blood pressure. I did put that picture with the blood pressure because it took me most of the morning to get a blood pressure on this little child who was absolutely frightened of the machine. And this was after we had the whole family tested. I did myself. I checked Sue's blood pressure. And we finally convinced him it was okay. And so uh, that's him. Had his blood taken, no problem. <laughs> but really had problems with the blood pressure. Okay. So who did we see? How did we go? So out of the 686 we began with, uh, we had um, 32 which were not yet found. We don't like saying that we lost them. Uh, we traced 95% of the original cohort and we saw 86% of them. Um, we had 18 deaths that had already happened at this place. Out of those 10 were early perinatal deaths. And technically, we should have actually not included them in the cohort, but they're there, so they're there. And eight of them afterwards died basically due to misadventure, uh, motor vehicle accidents, one non-inflicted injury, not really due to chronic disease. At this point, we only had one refusal. Uh, we did get consent from the parents, and the children then had to assent to us doing all these things. And the refusal was not from the mum, it from, was from a non-Aboriginal dad. Um, just keep that in mind as we go on. Uh, we did measure all the people we saw, but we got different rates of the other things. We had issues with blood pressure, as I said. We got renal ultrasounds on most of them. Uh, we did spirometry on most of them. And the blood is less because some children just didn't like it, and some of them technically we just didn't get enough. What did we find at 11 years? If we divide them up into the non-FGR uh, and the FGR babies, um, you can see that the main difference is that those who were born small had remained small in terms of their weight at uh, 11 years. There were high rates of undernutrition, especially in the ones who began small, and there was hardly any overweight, and there was no obesity at all. Looking at the chronic disease markers, which we were trying to um, look at, basically the only thing that was really there was abnormal ACRs, and this has continued to be high but hasn't quite progressed to kidney disease over time. And with the abnormal lipids, this is basically related to the low, uh, high-density lipoprotein that we see in most Aboriginal populations living remotely. Uh, we don't quite know why that is, though it's believed to be related to the diet as much as anything else. And we are not quite sure how that translates into a risk factor, but it is a known risk factor having a low HDL. If we compared our birth weight, current weight with these markers, uh, we found that basically current weight is the one that drives all these markers, and those are the ticks in red. And the only association we found with birth weight and later chronic disease markers was with blood pressure and birth weight, and that's the blue tick on the slide. So we took our... Um, Wave two as being an exploratory wave. Um, we decided that we could actually collect this. We can see a lot of the people. Um, and we made up for the lack of early growth data, which we'd got very patchily, by using our good NT clinical data, which actually is surprisingly complete along the way, especially related to weight, not so much with height. The one thing we did find is that we didn't have a good marker of socioeconomic status. And this is despite the fact that we actually collected quite a lot of items uh, along the way. Uh, and the only one with us and with other uh, studies as well was the household size. So we stuck to our basic division, which was remote and urban. Um, and just to give you a sense of how this works, 
This is the CIFA scale, and the dark red is the most disadvantaged. And this is about the area where we go. And you can see that almost all the areas where we go are most disadvantaged or slightly less disadvantaged. And we cannot actually discriminate within those areas or distinguish those who are better off or who are worse off because they're all lumped in the worst degree, which doesn't help us when we're trying to work out what's going on. Right. It took us a long time. We thought we'd go back after five years, but just getting the money from NHMRC was a big deal. We had shown that we can actually see people and we can follow them up, but we didn't have runs on the board in terms of being able to continually see them. We also wanted to do more than just record things, so we wanted to add a bit other things, try to do what we'd done before, but try and look for markers uh, that we could see earlier than conventional markers, and we wanted to look beyond the biological uh, model. So we did quite a lot of work trying to get the socioeconomic markers in. We added a mental health questionnaire, which was specially developed, and we added cognition as well. And we added some novel markers, which don't sound so novel because they're getting into uh, general practice, but when we used them way back then, they weren't really in the mainstream at all. We also added some teeth and did some grip strength because that was coming up as an easy marker of muscle strength and fragility and probably how well you do in later life. Because we were going out there, we tried to do things with topical studies, including iodine and hepatitis B, because our Aboriginal babies were the first in Australia to get hep B immunization at birth rather than the standard two months at that point in time. We also had to be very mindful that we wanted to go back and see these people, and the last thing we wanted was them running away as we tried to go and make contact with them. We spent a lot of time trying to balance what we wanted to do and what we thought was a feasible, non-burdensome thing for people. And one of the things we did at this time was developed what we call a structured, layered consent form, which gave people the option to choose whether they'd do all the various bits that we wanted to do or do some of them. Uh, we think this is actually a really good way to give people some control on what they do because they might want to be part of the study but decide they don't want their blood taken or not their blood pressure taken or they could choose to do everything. Okay. You can see that's a list of the lots of things which are expanding rapidly as we go on. The challenges remain the same but we had an added challenge this time that they were young people having babies and so one of the things we had to do was have a child minder when we went out to see people. We also at this time got very creative and decided to recruit an age match non-Aboriginal cohort. Had to be people who were born in Darwin and still living in Darwin which surprisingly was a very small denominator. And we called ourselves the Life Course Program from that time on. And we expanded the things we do. You can see some balance tests and you can see some magnetic boards out there. We didn't do quite as well this time as we did last time, but we did get to see uh, about 71% of those who were alive. The deaths had increased to 27 and almost all of the excess deaths from the last time were due to misadventure of some sort. And the outcomes were much the same. The underweight hadn't changed much for the small babies. There was a slight increase in overweight over this time. The metabolic markers were much the same, a slight increase in the leaky kidneys, as shown by the ACR. Uh, and we had high waste. This, we thought, was very exciting and would be an early marker. But we ran into trouble the next time round because we had to use a small reference point. Kids are not helpful because with ages things change and so you can't apply one standard reference for to a 10 year old the same that you can apply for a 14 year old. And we didn't actually find that better than BMI as we went further. The associations were much the same. Current size was the main thing and the blood pressure was the only one showing with associations with birth weight. 
And then we went back to wave four. We tried to refine what happened and see that we had comparable measures. Our very specially designed emotional well-being questionnaire, the strong souls, didn't work very well for us because we had a four-point scale, not a five-point scale, and we couldn't compare it with anything nationally because we had different questions. So we had to go back to more standardized questions as well. We thought this was with the age that we'd actually going to see obesity and markers, but we didn't. We had to go through a lot more hoops to try and get permission to go out, and this is just a flowchart of the number of people that we had to consult before we got permission to go to a community. And we did have 40 different places to go to, so it took a lot of time. And this keeps changing on us. Ethics has evolved over time. What was acceptable previously is not acceptable now. Uh, Sue just asked verbal consent in wave one. We asked the parents in wave two. We've got uh, information booklet, which looks like somebody's thesis, and it takes us at least 20, 25 minutes to talk through things to consent people to take part in the study. What did happen, though, was media coverage evolved, equipment was lighter, things became battery-operated, and we got very excited uh, with the mobile phones especially. But the mobile phone numbers keep changing, people don't have credit on it, so it wasn't quite as exciting as I hoped, and I thought we'd just be able to contact everybody. There's a small study from one of our larger communities, and the average life of a phone in a remote community is 2.3 weeks. And as the technology evolved, uh, we thought we'd actually go back to felt boards. And our version of the felt board was this magnetic board, because the one socioeconomic marker that we were very keen to get was how many people stayed in the house last night. And people always underestimate it unless you take them through things. So we used these pictures, the smiley person is you, and then we went through all the possible people who could live in the house. And then we put the study ID on it, and we took a picture, and then we could come back and try and describe it later and not use our very valuable face-to-face -face time finishing of this. We did quite well at this stage. We were a bit worried because they were not in school, they were mobile, they were independent, but we still saw 71% of all the people. And what did we find in terms of things? We had, if we just look at BMI categories, the blue is underweight and the red is obese, and this is how the next few slides are set out. So you've got the males and the females, and in each category you've got the birth, ab Aboriginal birth cohort, the remote living, the urban, and our non-Aboriginal cohort like that. The interesting point in this is the young girls who live remotely, and you can see that there's still high rates of undernutrition, although the overweight obesity is increasing in them. So we still have a dual burden out there. It's not just all obesity. And this varies according to the shires. These are the three main regions in our area. And you can see that the categories of uh, BMI are quite different depending on where you live. Uh, the Big Daily Shire has the leanest people, and the urban Aboriginal people are the most, uh, showing the most obesity and overweight. If you look at them again by overweight and obesity, you can see that our FGR babies continue to be small. There's hardly any obesity even at 25, although it's increasing as they go get older. And this is just showing how it's coming, but it's coming a bit later. Our chronic disease markers are still low. These slides basically just show them from 18 to 25. The darker ones are actual disease, and the lighter ones is the pre-disease. So for hypertension, you can see that there's actually very little. Um, the HbA1c, which we're using as a marker of diabetes, you can see that there is more of that, but not quite as much, and most of it is in our urban indigenous. Inflammation is high, getting higher. The ACRs seem to have stabilized, but they are highest marker. LDL, high um, LDL, low HDL, and you can see that it's actually quite high across the board, even as they're getting older. 
The difference mostly we saw was in the lifestyle factors. Smoking, unfortunately, hasn't gone down despite all the money that's being spent in trying to reduce smoking. That is our remote living young women, and the rates are up over 70%. But the public health message is getting across to somebody. So the people who are actually seeing it are, are young girls in town, uh, the non-Aboriginal ones, who are really smoking less than even our NT average. Alcohol is interesting because people actually drink a lot of alcohol. Um, this is remote people who don't drink, and this is our non-Aboriginal people who don't drink. And I don't know what the reason for this is. It's probably more likely access than anything else, um, rather than a difference in people's intent in drinking. What happened with the chronic diseases markers? You can see as people get bigger, the rates of blood pressure go higher, HbA1c gets bigger. We tried to tease this out with more statistics. Um, sophisticated stats, and you can see that birth weight, it's not that it doesn't have any influence at all, but it is indirectly through current weight, and maybe we'll see it this time when they get bigger and fatter. The other thing to think about is what happens over generations. When we saw them at 20, uh, 112 babies had already been born to our young cohort, and Interestingly, there were still really high rates of BMI. These are post-birth, but it's still worrying that about half the cohort girls of this generation had low birth weights, and so many of them were smoking, which are the three main factors that explain FGR, even in this generation. Just quickly with the iodine sub-study, this was a topical uh, study. We missed out because it was too difficult and too expensive. And you can see the green is actually replete, and they thought we'd be replete as well, but we weren't. Uh, we had very low levels of iodine. And so this information went to inform the national policy, so instead of it being restricted to Tasmania and the southern states, it actually became a nationwide thing. And then when we went back, we actually managed to see them post. And though there's lots of information out there, we're the only people with data on the very same people pre and post the fortification. And you can see that it's increased across the board. But the ones that don't quite meet repleteness is our remote indigenous women. So where are we now? We're actually in the midst of collecting data for wave five. Uh, we're trying to do a qualitative assessment, uh, get more detailed understanding of what's going on. Um, we hope that we will match our 71% from last time. We found that there's no significant increase in chronic disease markers till this stage, but we know that in this population, and this is a graph that represents what happens, is there's nothing much happens till about age 30, and then the chronic disease markers go up. And this is the same whether you're looking at obesity, diabetes, hypertension. The worrying thing in all this is our young women who still have a dual burden of underweight and overweight. The risk factors for low birth weight are persisting into this generation. They are still iodine deficient despite the improvement, and we need to target them with separate supplementation. This is the intergenerational stuff. They say that when you're pregnant, uh, because the baby is already there, and at 20 weeks, the ova for the next generation are already there. Anything you affect in the mother actually affects three generations, not just two. So our young, childbearing mums are people we should target. Just to put it back in the life course perspective, uh, this is showing you plasticity over time, which decreases, and the risk of chronic diseases is on the x-axis. And you can see that interventions that happen early will have the most impact, and those that happen late have less impact. We are currently here, and so it doesn't mean we don't do anything. We still need to keep doing things, but we would have more impact if we'd actually begun back in the preconceptional thing. And anything we do is likely to affect more than one generation. 
that's it from me. Sue would say, on, on, which was her main uh, catchphrase. If you want to know more about the study, we do have a website where you can look up things. And I have lots of people to thank who've been involved with this study, all the study teams over time, people who gave the money, in-kind support which we get from the health departments, the remote clinics and schools, and most of all, the participants who take enthusiastically take part and continue to be involved and who allow us the privilege of having a glimpse into their lives. Thank you. Okay.